So welcome to this session. Uh, thanks for coming to um, to this this half of the plenary. Hopefully uh, the lunch and the itis hasn't set in, and so you're actually going to be engaged. And uh, we're going to have some presentations and dialogue about uh, hip hop culture, and more specifically about uh, some kind of political trajectories in hip hop. And you've seen um, the program for today is beyond the beats new perspectives in hip-hop culture I, I do have to say we had original the earlier title for this was towards a radical critique of hip-hop culture um, so some of the stuff that you're going to hear is not particularly the newest thing but it's the thing that we don't hear enough of and so we're trying to elevate the discussion um, beyond the simple uh, focus on the music per se and to look at the world beyond the music, look at the world that's reflected in the music, um, and look at the world that the music helps to shape. And uh, it's kind of a dialogic relationship there. And uh, we have a distinguished panel for you. Um, let me introduce myself. I am uh, Chris Tenson, um, co-founder and um, co-host of Trigger Radio. We have Trigger Media Group out in Western Massachusetts in the Amherst area. Anybody from Western Mass? All right, thank you. Candace represent, no doubt. Uh, yeah, there is a part of Western Massachusetts that, you know, is actually with cities and buses and, you know, civilized over there. I know y'all think Boston is where it's at, but um, we're on the western part of the state, Springfield, Holyoke, uh, Northampton, Florence, Amherst and I also teach African American studies at Hampshire College which is in the same area and um, let me just give you a quick uh, rundown of who else is going to be speaking today uh, we're going to have Mariama White Hammond who um, is executive director of Project Hip Hop which is based in Boston and uh, she's a Boston native actually and uh, Project Hip Hop they use the, the acronym hip hop for highways into the past, history, organizing, and power. Uh, Mariana began her involvement with Project Hip Hop at the age of 14 when she was introduced to community organizing through the group's summer civil rights tour. Um, in addition to her commitment to social justice, she is also passionate about the arts, pursuing singing and spoken word work as well. In addition to her work with Project Hip Hop, she is a preacher at Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church, Bethel AME. As a preacher, she is committed to challenging the Christian church to embrace a more radical understanding of the life and mission of Jesus Christ and to focus more energy on addressing issues like climate change, AIDS, and food sovereignty. So that's Mary Emma. Sure. In the middle there is a distinguished guest, also Rosa Clemente, and you should definitely know who Rosa Clemente Woo! is. <laughs> exactly. Ran on the vice uh, for vice president, along with Cynthia McKinney, on the Green Party ticket in the last um, election. Um, she's been active for a number of years and um, just phenomenal person and uh, intellect and activist uh, in, in this thing called hip hop culture um, and politics. To her left is Jared Ball. Um, Professor of Communications and Africana Studies at Morgan State University. He also has a forthcoming book that you all should have. It's going to be on AK Press. Um, it got pushed back um, in the true essence of, of hip hop. It got pushed back uh, a month and uh, it's coming out next month. I Mix What I Like, uh, Mixtape Manifesto. And uh, Jared Ball is going to be talking about that work that's related to that. So we're trying to have a dialogue at the end of our presentations, um, you know, write down your questions during our presentations. We're going to hear from all the speakers first, and then we'll open it up to some dialogue and, and uh, Q&A. Is that cool with everybody? All right. So Mary Emma is going to kick us off, and uh, here we go, Beyond the Beats. Um, good afternoon. First, I just want to uh, thank you all for being here. Obviously, this is an issue um, that's near and dear to my heart, so I think it's um, great that we have some time to dialogue around this. I think it's really important um, to uh, always start our understanding of the work with a little bit of story, and so I'll tell just quickly what my own story is and what brings me to this work. Um, I grew up in the church. That's where I had my sen sense of community, in the AME church. Um, I grew up in an Afrocentric church. Um, 
and I always was involved in the arts. I sang, I danced, um, I grew up in the era of KRS-One and Africa medallions, and I um, was cleaning out uh, my room and found my old self-destruction tape. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, which was funny because a lot of the young people I work with have never seen a tape. Um, so they were clowning me. Um, and um, I have always um, grown up with a sense of the need for justice. It was just a part of the way, um, like I said, my church was very Afrocentric. I mean, we met Rosa Parks in, uh, in our school and reenacted her uh, ride as like two-year-olds on those tiny little chairs you have at preschool. So um, there were these three worlds, all of which were important to me, all of which was, I was involved in, but the frustration I, sent, uh, I felt for a long time is that those worlds did not come together. Um, that I had a deep sense of spirituality and community, I had a deep sense of artistic expression and development, I had a deep sense of um, justice and activism, but felt like each of these worlds had something that the other one could have used if they could have come together in a deeper way. Um, and so I got involved with Project Hip Hop when I was 14 um, and went on a civil rights tour where we go through the South meeting um, veterans of the civil rights movement and vis uh, visiting important sites of struggle. And what I think was amazing for me is to see something where I felt like the art, the spirituality, and the activism were all coming together at the same time. That people were acting um, from a deep um, you know, sense of faith, of hope, and at the same time, um, they were really challenging the status quo um, going up and not just praying that God was going to uh, change it. So I, I think for me, I think what I would say is that I believe that movement always happens at the intersection of things. Um, and so that Project Hip Hop really um, has worked hard to live at the intersection um, between arts and organizing. Um, while it's true that the civil rights movement was built on the spiritual, cultural, and organizational infrastructure of the black church, I don't think the next movement that we need in this country is going to be built on that infrastructure. Now, I'm certainly working within the church to make it more relevant and more committed and et cetera, et cetera, but I don't think that it will be the infrastructure on which another movement can be built. So the question is, what can that infrastructure be? And I wanna be very, very clear that I don't think hip hop itself is the infrastructure on which another movement can be built. But I do think it is a key and important tool, a transmitter of culture that can be an important part of making that movement happen. So I think that um, we do need to unite people under a transformative belief system um, and um, and to use hip hop as the language, um, not again because you know I, I don't believe like hip hop is inherently social justice oriented. I I don't believe it. It's not exactly. It's not my experience, but I do think it is a global language. And if we claim it as a space and decide what our values are going to be, then it will transmit. Hip hop will transmit whatever values the um, creators are putting into it. Um, and so we do need to have a deeper discussion about values, and I want to clarify that even as we talk a little bit more about how we specifically um, use hip hop. So at Project Hip Hop, we define our work as cultural organizing, um, and that's different than arts making or anything else. We, we define it specifically as the art of making culture whose intent is to challenge the status quo by pushing the audience slash participants to take action in the social, political, or economic realm. Um, you start the work, you start the creation from the perspective of where you want the audience to be and not from the perspective of what you might personally feel. I'm not saying it's not okay to create art or media based on what you feel. That I, There are times when I've just got something to say and I've got to get it out. But the difference between cultural organizing and just creating um, art or media is that you start from the understanding of where the audience is and where you would like them to be or what you would like them to see and that is your first motivator. And secondly, it always has an action-oriented um, push to it. You're always trying to get people to move from where they are to take a concrete step in a different direction. And that's what we sort of define as cultural organizing um, for us. So. Given that, I wanted to um, just share one or two examples of what we do specifically, and then um, I will have exhausted my time on the mic. Um, and so um, one example of I'll give is that we currently have a street theater team. And a lot there's been a real revival of street theater as a, a methodology. 
However, many of the people that do street theater don't actually do it on the street. Now that is because it is a, it's its own challenge. So for instance, um, we have a rug in our office, which is a little ratty at this point, but we can't throw it out because it's worked for us for so long. It's smaller than the size of this table. Um, and we create performances that inherently have to fit on that rug. We say to young people, if it can't fit on the rug, then it can't be done. Because that rug represents what we think is about a, a, a decent amount of public, a, a decent amount of space that you can find in any public venue. Um, so they create pieces that are about seven minutes long. Um, whenever we take on an issue, um, seven minutes but there may be multiple chunks so if we do have a large you know some place where we can perform inside or we just have a larger audience they can put a number of the pieces together but they can break them down um, they're set up so that uh, one of our primary performance spaces is Dudley Station um, it's the second largest bus station in the country and about 30,000 people move through it every day uh, one of the things we say to young people is if we even capture a tenth of the people <laughs> that are moving through the bus station, we would have been really effective in reaching our community around whatever topic that we're doing. So a concrete example is last year, uh, or last summer rather, we did a piece on the war on drugs called Broken Vials, Tales from Between the Cracks. And they performed in Dudley Station and Ruggles Station, which any of you have been on, it's, it's on the orange line. Um, we performed at the uh, Pine Street Inn, which is one of our uh, local homeless shelters, um, and summer camps, just about anywhere. Um, and the, the importance of that street theater is that you set your work up from the very beginning to reach people where they are, as opposed to asking them to come to a theater where you are um, and where you have all the, uh, the props attached. Um, so that's just one example of the work that we're doing. I wanted to play a song, and it you know, didn't quite load. Um, we had young people uh, a couple years ago did a remix of the civil rights movement song ain't gonna let nobody turn me around um and they actually and hopefully maybe i won't, won't say we we did sample somebody hopefully they won't be uh, suing me um but it was um an important thing we actually had young people do a deep analysis of where did the song come from what was it used for what was how was it motivating people and then what were the current issues that we're dealing with that we could say um, would apply in the same way and then they were able to perform that so i mean i think for us um, i could talk a lot more about methodology etc um, and you know i do think uh our, our, well, I'll share this one thing that's really key. I think that um, a lot of young people um, come into our space and have not had place to really contest the ideas um, and decide what they believe in. Um, I think that our, so many times our young people are used to consuming things without having the opportunity to really deliberate around them. Um, and for years, we did um, work, I think, you know, like, many people did, where we would start from the frame of racism and then be like, they can build out from there. Our experiences, like, it didn't, didn't really get down like that. We had a lot of young people who had a real critique of the system um, around racism, but it didn't apply to gender, it didn't apply um, to homophobia, it didn't apply to a lot of other things, um, and they didn't necessarily have a radical critique of themselves. Because I think to do this work, you have to be able to critique yourself as much as you're critiquing any system. Um, and so our work is really built around five very simple frames that um, ask, and they build on themselves. So for instance, I'll just give an example of one of the frames. We use the clip from The Matrix where Morpheus um, asks Neo, to, does he want to take the red pill or the blue pill? Do you want to live? Um, you know that it's a partial lie. Do you want to really know what the truth is? Or would you like to just continue to live in the fog? And so that's a question we ask young people. Do you really want to find that truth? Or are you OK with things the way they are? Um, and then at, at the final level of, of uh, analysis, we then say to them, well, if you know this, your job is to be Morpheus for others, to use our hip hop work to pe help people move out of that fog, to offer them a different level of truth and a different level of analysis that can start them on their own path, their own journey. So um, we try to uh, really live at that intersection um, intentionally, um, and I certainly can uh, answer more questions down the line, um, but I'm a preacher, and I am seven seconds from finishing, so I'm done. <laughs> This is a video that was made by four hip hop artists of mine and Cynthia's run. Talk about 
about universal health care Funds for schools, we built New Orleans and put the budget in green Leave the oil in the soil, bring the troops home Stop pimping the Middle East, we need peace After pressure, there's release, and after war to be a cease Fire, no more lying, it's time to get higher Let's get behind her, the real writer, a real freedom fighter Cynthia McKinney speaks for the many November 2008, man, it's just the beginning We get 5% and 25% the whole election, it starts with your selection Here's my suggestion, choose wisely Live lively, make the masses the mighty She's shining, see, the light is blinding me I'm running with her, she's the one that's guiding me To run, run, and the VP speaks for me, a hip hop Puerto from the NYC, La Rosa de Concreto, Clemente, Puerto Rico, Independiente, Resistente, for la gente, for the people, we oppress, repress, living in a mess, we blessed to have a sister that's keeping it real, someone sitting at the table who knows how we feel, here's the deal, in homelessness, raising living wage, hurry up to find a cure for AIDS, tear down Guantanamo, stop torturing war cause I don't wanna go, you wanna know something, the time is now, while I'm rhyming now, you should be outside co-signing now, that's why I wrote this man, we ain't playing, you already know this, you hear saying, this is a historical moment, peace, this is a historical moment, justice, this is a historical political party and we are green this is a historical moment peace this is a historical moment there is a political party that means what it says and does what it means can't blacklist the black sister with the power of the people and the force of the twister they tried to kick her out she came right back america blacked out but she brought the light back you're the one run cynthia run shining like a sun cynthia run you're the one run cynthia run the moon has begun so run 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 so run 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 so I have seven minutes. I started with that because if Every progressive media outlet had run that, we would have got our 5%. And that's the truth. So you see I said progressive media, not mainstream. And I mean that. So um, my name is Rosa Clemente. I consider myself a black Puerto Rican, independence, freedom fighter, revolutionary. Um, I call myself a hip hop radical now because when people are calling themselves hip hop Democrats and hip hop Republicans, then we have to draw a line in hip hop right now, like at this moment, right? So, you know, if cats want to run like that and get co opted by the Democratic Party nonprofit industrial complex, then those of us who do believe that hip hop is inherently about social justice because hip hop comes from black and brown people in the poorest congressional district to this day, the South Bronx, where these young people really came together to first what? Stop gang violence. Right? That's what Africa Bambada transitioned from a gang member. And to also protest the budget cuts. This was in the 70s of what was going on in New York City. At that time, New York City was bankrupt. Um, so for me, when I talk about hip hop too, I think it's important to say that hip hop is five elements. Like, I'm not a rapper, I'm not a recorded artist who performs, and I never will be. Just like I believe a lot of rappers shouldn't try to run for office. <laughs> Like, play your position, <laughs> you know, like, you think that you can run for office and not understand political science or what it means to run. Just like there's no way I'm just going to throw 32 bars down and think it's good work because I'm in hip hop. You know, and I think it's important to begin to differentiate that. In fact, this panel, the panel name was changed and we didn't change the panel name. So I'm like kind of curious to find out why our panel, the name, the title that we pick was changed at Free Press Conference. I don't know who made that decision. We purposely wanted it to say radicalism 
you know, um, because again, to me, radical is not, you know, whatever people envision, violence and all that. It's a, at the end of the day, this is about self-determination, right? The, and this, this, this concept of within hip hop, we are gonna have to figure out, because everyone's pimping hip hop politically. So how are we gonna figure out, or how are we gonna organize a political movement out of that, which I think is possible, but I don't think it's happening now at any level, especially in the United States of America. So I started with showing the video because I wanted to just let folks know, you know, it's been three years since we got that nomination, and if hip hop can't challenge Nancy Pelosi being at this conference, like seven of us in a room of 2,000 people did yesterday while people were booing us, what are we doing? Why, how can we call ourselves progressive when we let someone like that, a warmongerer, and not challenge her, right? Essentially, hip hop is about challenging. Now, the thing is, she got secret service agents. We, we ain't gonna do nothing. But people had to give her a standing ovation, which made me think, it's not the people. Everybody has the right to the politic. It's maybe we may not be in these spaces too much longer if we're gonna be hip hop radicals. And then within people of color, really, what is our media apparatus that we actually own? We're really dependent on the niceness of white progressives and lefts at this point to fund any of our projects. And I have to say that, and people don't want to hear that. People don't want to hear that the nation did not run one story on mine and Cynthia's run. People don't want to know that, you know, I, I've been on Democracy Now! at least 14 times. I love Democracy Now! No doubt. But one of the critiques I had during our run was the amount of times that Ralph Nader was on compared to Cynthia McKinney. Now that could also be on the flip side. We didn't have a strong media. We, we're not Ralph Nader. We don't have a couple extra million dollars. In fact, when Cynthia got the nomination, Ralph Nader's, a lot of people in the Green Party left the party, right? In fact, the, for the first couple weeks while we were running and I came out on a hip hop platform, you know, people were calling us the craziest names, like 300 Green Party members resigned in protest because we decided to go to the DNC. And we decided to actually talk about a specific, very important um, issue within the hip hop political movement, the issue of political prisoners. You know, but for the white folks in the Green Party, we were too radical. For black folks, we were selling out. For Latino folks, they're like, what the, like, what are you doing, who are you? You know, and then because I came out on a hip hop agenda, my nomination speech literally was like, I am the vessel for the hip hop political movement, a, a little victory that got us here. You know, so we have to say that I don't think we can no long, we can't afford to talk about what we already know. We already know how the Tea Party is rolling. We already know how the Democrats are rolling. Like, what is a progressive Democrat? That's like a complete contradiction. They don't, they're sorry, they don't exist. And Dennis Kucinich is not as progressive as a lot of people think, but he, or maybe Bernie Sanders in him. But the reality is, right, like, I was hoping that our run would at least become a place where people would not only think about organizing as just, you know, electoral politics, but to use everything within hip hop that can that can share information, that can let folks know. So, you know, it wasn't, again, it wasn't just progressive, white progressive media. We were blacked out, we were browned out. The, the National Women's, <laughs> National Organization for Women wouldn't even put that we were running. Miss Foundation, I mean Miss uh, Magazine, wouldn't even write a full article on Cynthia. 
you know, and I chalk that up to a lot of things, but at the end of the day, I think within hip hop, what we need to do now is those of us who might take on a radical perspective, a nationalist perspective, an anti-colonial perspective, is we have to figure out how we're gonna build our own media apparatus that we own, that we control, that consistently tells the story of particularly black, brown, other poor people in this country, and that we also get that global sharing of information because globally, hip hop is, you know, people say it's better globally. I think what it is is that people are in such dire conditions globally that they don't have time to be riding a fence. They have to make a hardcore political choice. And hip hop, I think, allows that because hip hop is supposed to be in your face. It's supposed to be ugly. You're supposed to feel uncomfortable, but it's always a respectful thing. You know, you can dialogue and debate, but when, like, we ain't trying to kill people. <laughs> like, you know, we ain't trying not to work with white people or anything like that. You know, at the end of the day, you also got to roll with people based on politics, right? <laughs> like, F Clarence Thomas, like, I'm rolling with the Weather Underground, or, you know, whatever, Iraq Veterans Against the War, before I'm even, like, trying to roll with and some of these black and other Puerto Rican glitterati that I call them in hip-hop kind of scholars that have never been to the Bronx, do no research, don't know what they're talking about, but have jobs at Harvard University talking about hip-hop, but have never been in communities where hip-hop comes from. So we have to put that out there, and you know, that's me, that's how I roll. I try to be in the best tradition of hip hop, and I think yesterday, um, even though only seven to 10 of us stood up, that is hip hop. Not letting Nancy Pelosi go without saying, hell no, stop the war. How are you talking about free press when you have Bradley Manning in jail? Don't tell me you don't have power over that, right? So that to me is hip hop. There are four things I just wanted to say off the top. Uh, well, a fifth thing now, because I want to, again, publicly identify myself with this hip-hop radical label. And I think it's essential that we uh, expose as many of the uh, uh, arguments and contradictions that exist in hip-hop as a cultural expression, in the scholarship, in the journalism that emanates out of it or that uh, is used to cover it. Um, because ultimately, which is the first point I just wanted to make, we are in a political struggle. And I think that that is ultimately what always has to be remembered. It's a media reform movement. There are other efforts within uh, um, this society and around the world to change the world, but those are all subsets of a broader political struggle. However you want to identify that or define that, I, that's another discussion or debate, but I think that's the first thing we have to always remember. Uh, and I'll come back to that in just a second, but the second point I just want to make is that media are ideological. Uh, we are not talking about uh, the organized technologies of media. We need to understand them as ideological and in service of a political struggle. Uh, and thirdly, we need an underground press uh, George Jackson, I uh, want to evoke his name as often as possible, the great philosopher uh, um, and uh, 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 political scientist, um, political prisoner, uh, said that we need three things. We need an underground army. I'm not a revolutionary, so I'm not going to do that. But we also need an underground press, and we need uh, a radical alternative political party uh, if we're going to advocate and promote and make popular the ideas that we need change and real change in this society, in this world. Uh, and then fourth, we need a social movement to do that. We need the movement that is meant to emanate out of that. And I don't want us to think that the media reform movement or any of the other things that many of us are involved in uh, um, uh, constitute this movement uh, in any way that I think needs to be seen as sufficient. Um, so I just want to go back to those points just very quickly uh, and reiterate just a, a few and give some depth to some of them. This, this idea of a political struggle, now my preference is to use the uh, uh, internal, colonial, internal colonialism theory or analysis or uh, uh, perspective when talking about black America and Latin America. I don't like this idea that we're talking about, uh, you know, America as a failed democracy or America as, you know, being somehow, you know, just slightly deficient here or there. No, America is an empire. And a lot of people here talk about America as an empire. Many of the books that are written at this conference and are on sale at this conference describe America as an empire. But then there seems the analysis that flows from that initial point seems to dissipate or just simply disappear. If America is indeed an empire, then we have to acknowledge that empires don't create democracies and free citizens, they create colonies, including those nations subsumed within the very borders 
uh, of the United States. Of course, the indigenous population, black America, Latin America, uh, Chicano populations have long been theorized, like this is nothing new that I'm doing. It's just that this wing of analysis has been suppressed just like many other things are suppressed in this society as an empire <laughs> is, is supposed to do. It's supposed to suppress that which would develop its own demise. So we get a lot of uh, 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 analyses that emanate from this, this idea that we have a flawed democracy and with some tweaks here or there will be okay and I think that results in a lot of stagnant and uh, uh, you know short run uh, incomplete movements. Secondly, uh, as I said, media are ideological. Once you understand, you know, by the way, let me just back up. Franz Fanon said just very simply, colonialism is the complete and total conquering of land and people, period. That's all. In fact, he said that is all. So it's not that deep, it's that we're talking about conquering land and people. So in that sense, we can't be talking about people just, you know, not having, again, perfect forms of democracy to, to, to uh, or, you know, reach to where the vote isn't somehow just, you know, whatever. And, and um, uh, uh, we just need to, you know, do more to uh, uh, influence our politicians and so on and so forth. That isn't how you end a colonial relationship, unfortunately. It would be nice if, that were, uh, if it were that simple. So as part of a political struggle, once, you, once we establish that, then we, we can talk about media as ideological. Again, media are often described as the technologies. We talk about media in terms of film, radio, so on and so forth, instead of the ideas that they're used to disseminate, the ranges of thought they're supposed to establish as sanctioned and acceptable. So if you, you know, so again, as, as Rosa demonstrated, if you challenge Nancy Pelosi at a media reform conference, you'll get mild support at best, because that hasn't been established as an acceptable norm, an acceptable, uh, and this is, of course, what popular Hip hop, popular scholarship, popular news, popular you know films are designed to do give an acceptable range of thought. And if you go outside of that range, you are deemed as inappropriate at best, uh, and at worst, you're put in prison like many of the political prisoners who are still left in there. So, with all due respect to to, to Brother Manning, uh, all these political prisoners have been in worse conditions or similar conditions for many more years. You're talking about people who are in prison in solitary confinement for decades who are not even discussed, even in media reform spaces. They're not even discussed. We don't, re we don't interview them. We don't tell stories about them. They're not sexy. Nobody wants to, you know, nobody cares because not only because of the, 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 the struggle they represented, but the hopelessness that's often associated with their cases. So we, we just ignore it. Um, and you're right, and Rose is right, that they are also assassinated as well if they're not, you know, fortunate enough to be put in a cage for the rest of their lives. Um, but this is what media are supposed to do. So I think we sometimes lose sight of that in discussions, especially in these spaces of media reform, we lose sight of what media are here to do. So it's not a matter of reforming media. Media as they currently exist have to be completely abolished. And that of course can only happen if you have a political movement that replaces uh, the hierarchy, that replaces those in power with new forms of power, new forms of uh, dominant ideas. By the way, there's, uh, if, if any of you ever take the time, the International Journal of Communication ran a really great debate, actually, uh, that took place between, um, uh, uh, which included Robert McChesney and, and, and three others who were very critical of this media reform movement. Uh, and Makani Themba Nixon was one of the contributors, and she just made, she raises the point, um, I just want to just say this very quickly, because the, the, the argument is, is that, that was, um, you know, brought up to criticize this media reform movement was that it does disassociate itself from the, the more oppressed communities in this society. It doesn't talk about the other political issues affecting more oppressed communities, and they felt that there was this disconnect weakening this, this media reform movement. Uh, and McConaughey Thumb Nixon simply, you know, she, I'm not trying to reduce her entire argument, but she does say that media reform has struggled with nearly all of the typical challenges in this regard. And what she means by typical challenges is something that Rosa brought up very quickly also, that there is always this tension between radicalism and reform or revolutionary uh, politics and, and reform politics, and also this tension that exists, uh, unfortunately, between white liberals and black and brown radicals, where, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of room is afforded, a little bit of space is afforded, and, you know, even go so far as to vote for a black president. Uh, but real issues affecting the, 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 these, these communities and, and really engaging in the arguments that radicals or so-called radicals or revolutionaries bring up um, conceptually, 
uh, are ignored or, or suppressed. So even when, you know, and I've even done some, some degree of study of this, even when we look at Democracy Now! and Robert McChesney's Media um, Matters radio program and others, including uh, uh, Fairness and Accuracy and Reporting's Counterspin and others, you see a complete absence of uh, stories focused on black and brown people and indigenous people even worse. So when there was a study that came out a couple um, last year that was where a lot of the, the left-leaning media were, were focused on where um, uh, NBC's Meet the Press as the flagship uh, Sunday uh, morning news program was, was analyzed and said that black people are, are absent, I think it's 70 cent, 70, 70, 77% of those shows have no black people on there. Uh, well, I went through the calendar year uh, and looked at Democracy Now! and in terms of black Americans who were on the program to discuss black American-centered issues, it was even less than that. 88%, I think, was the, the, the percentage I reached, uh, had no black discussion at all. Uh, and I think we could do the same thing for Latin America, and I think indigenous people is even more easier. I mean, I think they did two shows with indigenous focus uh, in the calendar year. So if Democracy Now! was the flagship of the media reform world, we see the same kind of erasure of black focus, of Native American focus, of, of Latino focus. Um, and within that, the radical uh, wing of these communities' politics would even be less represented. So this is something that we've argued in terms of hip hop as well. You know, you're going to get a lot of popular re reference to uh, rap music, but uh, even in left-leaning spaces, progressive or radical rap music is, is, is equally ignored. It is the hardest thing to get access to in terms of media exposure, even on the left-leaning, in, in left-leaning outlets, um, which is again the cultural equivalent to the political, that political radical politics or radical political politics are excluded by the nature of the system and those who defend it to whatever degree that they do. Um, so again, this is why I'm arguing we need an underground press. I've argued that the mixtape uh, as hip hop's original mass medium could be put to this use. Uh, we've tried a project in the DC area where, where I am. Uh, it has not been successful and I'm the first one to admit it for a number of different reasons. Number one, I, I've become more disconnected from a, a grassroots political organization organization, which is a problem for me individually and all of us collectively. Um, but it is also a low-tech, inexpensive option that allows for a free run of cultural and political and journalistic uh, content that can't get anywhere else on radio, uh, including in many cases Low Power FM, which is another thing we could discuss as well. And then again, just to go back to the fifth point with uh, George Jackson, what he ultimately was concluding is that we need a movement. We just need a movement. We don't have it. It doesn't exist uh, at this at this point, and it's uh, um, the 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 negative impact of that is uh, manifesting daily by the second all over the country and around the world. And very last, I just want to say as I as I give up the mic, I meant to start with this, but but got distracted. Amiri Baraka, our great elder, and I mean that. He came on the radio, on my radio program in 2008 and beat me and Rosa up for two hours uh, uh, telling us that we were fools, scoundrels, rascals for supporting Cynthia McKinney and not supporting Barack Obama. I do hope you all saw his most recent poem, The New Invasion of Africa, where he says that now you have a black president working for the colonial powers of the Western world invading Africa and he says returning us to slavery. I hope we all think about that in terms of where we are on the left and even on the radical left as we raise critiques of those who would raise challenges to Obama as we're going to do again in 2012 and think seriously about what we're going to do politically in this society if we're going to overcome any of the serious problems that continue to face us if we can't even have the discussion about Obama in, in these spaces or elsewhere or the, the cultural equivalent of Obama in terms of rap music and other forms of cultural expression. So thank you for that. Now, uh, One of the things that, that we should also think about are uh, the different types that I've identified different types that emerge within three different spaces, hip hop, media justice, and black studies. And in this case, I'm trying to integrate the different you know, positionalities of my own life and my own career and to really think about how these things intersect and overlap. The big thing is that black studies, some of you may know, or well, Africana, Africana Studies is celebrating 40 years in the academy. Um, that's an ongoing celebration that many coast-to-coast -coast programs are uh, celebrating at the moment, and hip-hop is coming up on a similar milestone. So that's a 4040 club of a different sort. <laughs> Shout out to Jay-Z on that. But how many of y'all remember um, Kanye West's infamous Bush doesn't care about black people? 
And then how many people heard the wonderful apology <laughs> that was uh, sponsored by Kleenex brand? I'm joking. Because um, he was up there crying is what I'm trying to say. And some of the things that, that Jared and Rosa and Marianne will point out is the fact that there's an absence of movement. Were Kanye connected to the struggles that are going on in the Lower Ninth Ward, the politics of return, the right to return movements, the take back the land movements, had he helped erect a new wall on the house in the Lower Ninth, he wouldn't have anything to apologize for whatsoever. But because he's disconnected, because he's an island unto himself, he can pose as an all-powerful person, but when the ish hits the fan, if y'all wasn't recording, I'd say it the real way, he's forcing to retreat. And that's the ultimate question that we have to really raise today, is that when will we cease to retreat when we raise these difficult and uncomfortable questions? And in the hip hop community, where there's a lot of packaged braggadocio and canned charisma, you have folks who, when they take a particular stand, get crushed, and then they run away. And this is where Kanye is. So no matter if he says, everybody has a new album, right? I know y'all got this, it's cool. You know, it's all right if you do. Uh, but he's got that wonderful lyric on there. He says, uh, they say that I was the abomination of abomination. Well, that's a pretty bad way to start a conversation. And so we, now we have to shine the light back on Kanye. But this is not about Kanye or about 50 or any of the individuals that we could really talk about um, who kind of are the, you know, uh, poster child or poster children for this kind of corporatization of hip hop culture. And so we want to talk about the world beyond the music. But... The world that if you are saying that you are all that powerful, which that lyric comes from a song called Power, and then you're forced to retreat, then that shows that hip hop, especially the, the people who are elite, the people who had the microphones, the videos, who are on 24-7, obviously they don't have as much power as they thought they did. And so we, run, we really want to say, how do we get beyond that and really connect back to struggle? There's a wonderful new book out um, edited by Fanonche Wilkins and Michael West and William Martin. It's called From Toussaint to Tupac, Black International Since the Age of Revolution. And in that book, they say that the unifying condition facing the black world is that of struggle, period. Struggle is the only thing that unifies the black world. And so in that case, if we say hip hop is a kind of newest expression of that ethos, then how is hip hop connected to that struggle is the main question that we have to ask. And there's a lot of groups out that don't get a lot of exposure nationally, but people like MXG, uh, United States Human Rights Network are a part of this effort to really reconnect. And a lot of them coast to coast, we don't have time to name them all right now. But we really need to get beyond, and I, I would say we need to really identify the three types. And the three types that I've identified is one, the thug. And if y'all took any Afro-American literature, you know about the tricks, the figure, and all this type of stuff. But the thug, T-H-U-G. Now, I've identified two types. One is broken down as such. Teaching humanity universal greatness. That's one type of thug. I'll put Tupac, I'll put Dead Prez, I'll put all the folks who've been mislabeled thug in that. And then the other thug is taking from humanity with unapologetic gusto. And in that one, I will put Vivendi and Sony and BFG and the real thugs who escape criticism. All right, they are doing it. They're writing their own rules as we speak. That's why we're at this conference. The second type, so that's the part 1A, 1A and 1B. The second type I would identify is what I call the bystander or the fence straddler, or some of y'all know from Dr. King's Birmingham uh, letter from Birmingham jail, that's the moderate, the go slower, the, it, it didn't happen, Rome wasn't built in a day, uh, take your time, we're getting better, easy goals. That concept also is something that stands in the way. And then we, when we have the last category, which is what we've been talking about today, which is the radical, but the radical has some sets of challenges facing it. It's not simply enough to say I'm a radical thinker 
or I'm pressing towards radicalism. And so the question that we're asking is, are we waiting on a movement like everyone else or are we movement builders ourselves? And that's the question of ownership of the struggle, of ownership of the history and the memory. Dr. Wade Nobles, a noted psychologist from San Francisco State University says that power is the ability to define reality and to have others accept that definition as if it were their own. And how do we really embody this quest to really truly empower our communities like we say in hip hop is supposed to do? And so I will leave it there and we can open it up for Q&A. I'm not sure if everybody in the room here has heard. The FBI has just released 100 pages uh, of a file on the, on the Notorious B.I.G. So uh, I want you all to know that and check it out and blog about it. I also want to talk about the fact that Miss McKinney and um, the new uh, Lasers album by uh, Lupe Fiasco mentioned uh, WTC7 and 9-11. And Miss McKinney wants an investigation in 9-11 as well. Uh, I think people here, uh, I, don't, I don't hear much talk about it, but I do hear talk about you know, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and all, all that. Um, and I, I do uh, appreciate the fact that hip hop fearlessly presents uh, the questions around 9-11, and I don't want to go off the subject. But, uh, you know, I think it's very important for all of us to continue that fight to find the truth uh, and, and not be afraid to be thought of as, you know, loons. Right. <laughs> um, I, I, I like to, since I'm older than everybody on the panel, I sort of get confused with the title hip hop because I was old enough to play it first in the 70s. I understand it, but I know what hip hop has turned out to for people under the age of 35 for the last 15 years. You know what we're talking about here, if you ask a 19 year old, they don't get it at all. And it's like we sort of, you, you know, it's like old people talking about something they don't know about. So to me to make this sort of effective, you, you either got to teach or take back the mainstream. It's like the word nigga changed over the years. It was a terrible word. Now everybody uses it. Hip hop was really positive, but if you tell me Waka Flocka and Lil Wayne, or you know we grab a word from Kanye or Lupe, it really doesn't make sense to me how it, you know, we're, we're talking about hip hop when it's gotten lost in the sauce over the years. That's all I'm saying. I, I know it's a time and, and place for certain people, but it's like we're getting old and we're losing it from everybody under the age of 35. So, so my, my early experience with hip hop was one thing. Like I came, like I said, I self-destruction, like it, it meant something very specific to me and I will always, that will always be true hip hop to me. But the reality is I work with young people who don't know who KRS-One is, do not know, I mean, like, my context for hip hop is like, I mean, old school is like four years ago, as far as they're concerned. So I think that one of the things I would push us to do is not to have to say that hip hop is one, it is this thing or that thing. I think that, you know, 50 has just as much right, in my opinion, to call himself hip hop as I do to say what I think hip hop is. And, and I think we're in a contestation of where we want it to go. Um, to me, hip hop is, it's just youth culture. It is an expression of youth culture. You can go back 100 years, young people were expressing them in themselves in a certain way. Um, and it is a, a particular medium. But I do think we get in this, because I've heard the whole like, well, that's rap, and this is really hip hop. And I'm just going to tell you on a, on a local organizing level that that conversation is destructive and it's not helpful. And so I think for me, my personal thing is you let everybody be hip hop. Now let's talk about what we value as a community. We love this culture. And I'm going to hold you accountable for the content and just hold you accountable for the content and not argue about whether or not, you know, the form, who gets to, uh, we, we don't have to have the form and the content go together. That's, and I'm just saying that that's some place I have come personally from doing work with young people. Like they don't, 
it is not helpful for me to tell them Lil Wayne is not hip hop in my opinion and why that may or may not be the case, right? Um, so the, as an example, when we argue, like if they're playing music that I think is misogynist, I'll be like, I wouldn't let you play KKK music in this car and you don't have to, you should not force me to listen to misogynist music. So let's talk about the content, let's talk about where we are, let's talk about the values that are in it um, without having to, to argue about who's really hip hop and who's not hip hop. So that would be my. I mean, I, I, I strongly disagree. I think that's the problem, that we don't set boundaries. So I don't care. I mean, I'm not trying to tell people not to call themselves hip hop. What I'm saying is that within the political movement, the nonprofit industrial complex, groups like Campus Progress, whack ass hip hop organizations and leaders like the Hip Hop Caucus and Reverend Lennox here would, no, you can call yourself hip hop all you want. But really, like, you, you know, we have to draw a line. And, the, and no, wait, no line has been drawn in 40 years, really. In, in ter I mean, lines have always been drawn, but, you know, I'm never about who can call themselves what. I call myself a black Puerto Rican. That is still not a popular thing in 2011. I would want no one to tell me that. But we have to have something right now that builds a movement. You can't make principles and ethics 40 years after. You have to come to the table from the beginning with principles and ethics. And I think there's still an over-reliance to talking about rap culture. Now look, rap is the predominant force of hip-hop culture. I'm not, I know that. But there is no other, you know, creation even in the last hundreds of years that speaks from New Zealand to Australia to Canada to everywhere where young people can say, well, I'm going to speak my truth and be blinged out all I want, and that's my hip hop. That's how I'm going to come to the table. Or you're going to have you know, Native American young people talking about the growing obesity condition or that. I actually don't think we give young people enough credit. Like I live in the Bronx. I'm always working with young people. I'm in the hood. You know, you're working with young people. There's been a lot of victories because hip hop has been the soundtrack to particularly stopping the prison industrial complex. These young kids that just got arrested in Georgia last week, undocumented, who took that risk. One of the sisters cited the group Rebel Diaz for, uh, she literally watched him and she said that moment changed her life. Just like for me, politic Dead Prez, the minute I played Let's Get Free, I was like, this is the kind of hip hop. So I'm never about that, you know, because, um, yeah, I, I would never want to do that. Um, and I, but I do think going back uh, to Paul's point about language, like what language, how are we talking to young people when we are really kind of this uh, first political generation of hip hop, the second one coming up, you know, they're stuck on Nicki Minaj to, you know, Lil Wayne, who I think all should fit in that, and we should debate that. Um, but I do think it's about new language with young people, understanding that these cats ain't trying to listen for more than five minutes, not just because of the fault of their own, but because of our society, the fact that everything is Facebook and Twitter, and people think that reading, you know, uh, a, a condensed version of uh, whatever artist or political figure or Malcolm X makes you a scholar because you read something on Facebook. There has to be more of an intellectual rigor right now that comes, and not an ac academic intellectual rigor, but like in any other culture, people, uh, as, as Dr. Clark would say, the, the memory, you, you hold that, you regard it, you talk the good and bad, you bring it up. And um, I think that is a very important thing that we have to do. But we gotta, like young people are doing amazing work. And I, I, I truly believe if progressive media, like where is the show that is only for 18 to 25 year olds that are running it? Like why isn't progressive media incubating young people to tell their amazing stories of how they continue to fight back? Oscar Grant, what's going on in Puerto Rico? You're talking about the largest student strike in the history of the United States of America and its colonies. And most of that soundtrack itself is, is you know, hip hop. So I, you know, I wish that progressive media would give the space for young people to tell these stories of victory too. Yeah. Can I say something real quick? Of course. Um, 
I just want to make, I just feel it's always necessary to be very clear here. The hip hop, there has been no end to the progressive production of good rap music. It has not stopped or even diminished since the time when I was coming up to now. The only difference is, the major difference is, is that the consolidation of media, the retrenchment of the right wing, the assault, the return, the resurgence of the anti, of, of the colonizing efforts have uh, resituated, just as Kwame Trey used to say, black visibility is not black power. So we see it in terms of popular rap music. I certainly, I can't imagine none of you, uh, you know, are, are unclear about we're not seeing it in terms of the presidency. Uh, we're seeing the same thing. Black people are, and Latinos, you know, Obama is, is deporting record levels of Latinos, more than George Bush, but more on the military industrial complex than George Bush. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a decrease in the so-called diversity of mainstream media. There's a decrease in mainstream coverage of black people in, in news, as the Pew Research Center shows. And at the same time, uh, there is a decrease of thoughtful, conscious, radical cultural expression in the mainstream, in the left uh, media spaces. So instead of this, so it's not that Whenever you show, and as, I, as, I, as a teacher, I do the same thing. You, once you show young people that there is a process behind what makes the popular song they hear popular, they become very clear. They become very clear. They start raising all the appropriate questions. They do all the appropriate things like finding alternative sources, raising up the names of other artists, so on and so on and so on. So I just want to make it clear that there, there has been no, even the, 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 you know, the, 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 um, the popularization of nigger has, has come as a part of this process. Chuck D made the point himself. In 1989, we're doing Fight the Power. By 1992, we're doing Gin and Juice on a label that was previously or one time owned by Seagram's Gin. This is intentional. This is the repression of potentially anti-colonial movements and it's going to keep coming cyclically. So to the extent that we try to exclude the radical politics of a Malcolm X, and I, we got to get into this whole Marable book thing too at some point. I hope you all investigate and look critically at what's happening with Malcolm again. We do the, you know, we have to, we have to uh, look critically at how uh, those politics are excluded today as they were repressed and suppressed back then. But they still exist, they're still relevant and they're still being done. It's just not heard, and we don't make space for it. I think. I think really quickly. I actually don't think. I don't I actually don't think we disagree. I think that hip hop is speaking your truth. Now I'm going to talk to you about your truth, my truth, and how we can get someplace about where where we go together. And I agree. I do think once you have that conversation, and you you know like when you ask young people to draw, where is Jay Z in the media? Um, power hierarchy. So first we ask them to just draw it. Tell me where he is based on what you think. And he's like at the top, you know? And then when you start breaking down that there's all these layers above him that they were unaware of, or that MTV and VH1 are owned by the same people, so they're not competing. Like, they're, you know, and the, the belief that these companies are competing and they're these small shops of people who are just playing mute, that they didn't, you bought your playlist, you didn't you know, it, there's none, there's nothing truly authentic behind what's happening. I do think that young people are, can be more than aware and find creative ways to take action to resist those things. So I just wanna, you know, I think we are on the same page on that. Let's take some more questions. Um, so I am um, a biracial 22 year old woman and I grew up in, um, in DC. And so from my experience within, I guess, hip hop and um, the black culture predominantly around youth, um, I've seen kind of this, this problem between kind of the personal struggle and, um, and the collective struggle. And I think that uh, there's no reason to, to kind of blame somebody for trying to better their, themselves personally. And I think that comes to a lot of what people call selling out, for example. But I guess my question is, how can we get beyond um, the personal struggle and into more of a collective struggle in organizing? I don't think it is a personal struggle. I don't think anything that people of color can do can be a personal thing. But that's my, you know, that's my opinion. Just like I believe who you choose to marry is a political decision. You know, so I don't, I, I personally, I couldn't ever separate the two. And I think that's the problem that, you know, 
you have, especially within hip hop, in the fifth element of hip hop that I'm knowledgeable about and reside in the most, uh, knowledge, culture, and politics, which now extends to hip hop in the academy or, you know, uh, hip hop in the nonprofit world, hip hop being used to rock the vote, sweat the vote, don't vote, all of that kind of stuff. Um, vote or die and we're still dying after we vote it you know I don't I just don't think especially within hip-hop culture it can be separated because what has happened in that fifth element is now you do have an elite elite class in that element now I can name names I'm okay with naming names particularly in the Academy right so you have hip-hop archives like at Cornell University right that students at Cornell can't access because it's in the rare manuscripts department and you have to go through all these levels. So you're a student at Cornell, they got Africa Bambada's entire archives and Joe Conzo, but a student from Ujima, a black student, couldn't go in the library and get the hip hop archives, right? So there's been now an elite class, an elite thing built. I call it the hip hop glitterati. You know, and they're mostly men in this thing. Some of them are friends, and I love them dearly, and you know, but it's not a personal thing. The, the, the reality is within that hip hop elite, they become the gatekeepers, or they become the only voice. So every time in the mainstream, and even progressive media, Michael Eric Dyson, all the time, you're the dude about hip hop, all the time, or Kevin Powell, great friend, but really, just you, um, a couple other cats. And what begins to happen is that these, I'm telling you, a handful of people get the money, get the book deals. I'm trying to get one book deal, you're on 14 books. Really, nobody's 14 books are that dope, you know? And they stop another class, not another class, but they stop things from happening. And the same within hip hop in the academy. You got cats using hip hop, making $100,000 salaries, sitting talking about, I got however many people in my organization. No, you got 450,000 emails. That's not a movement, homie. Like you writing a book that nobody's ever gonna read at Harvard, at the hip hop archives, where there are no black students in the class, how is that? So that's why I just wanted to expound on that about the personal, not just being personal, because then it affects the entire collective community. So that's how I, I come to the table with that. So I think um, the challenge that you raise is actually one that we deal with a lot. Um, the frame we use is around the concept of the good life. And we say that there are two ways to look at the good life, right? One is that there are a certain number of resources and everybody just fights to get what they can get and hope that you get to the good life, right? That vision of the good life means some people get it and some people don't. There's another vision of the good life and we try um, to link young people to international struggles around the, the concept of bienestar or bien vivir. The idea that the true good life can only be had communally um, because it means that we create a safety net for each other and we share resources together. Everybody probably has a little less but nobody goes to bed hungry. And what we say is those two concepts of the world can't live together at the same time. So we have to ask ourselves, which one are we going for? And that means that sometimes, you know, I may get a little less personally because I'm fighting for something where we can share a lot more collectively. So I'm not trying to hate on people because being hungry is no joke. And I have young people that I work with who've done some things in their past that at this point in their life, you know, they definitely wouldn't have done, but, but they did them from based on where they were and what they were struggling with at the time, and I'm not gonna hate or judge them for where they were. But now we're trying to build something different so nobody ends up in that place ever. And that's, you know, and it's a critique basically of capitalism. But we frame it in that way because the good life is what they've, We've heard what we've been sold, it's the American dream, and we have to ask ourselves what the alternative would be and then how we work for it. As a black man with a white mother also from D.C., um, 
more specifically as uh, a colonized new African with a white mother from Washington, D.C., uh, I would invite you to join some organizations in the area. We're rebuilding the chapter of the Malcolm X grassroots movement there. There's Words, Beats, and Life. There are a number of any other things happening. Come on, Freeman, Black Love Fest. This brother is connected to about everything going on in the area. We, we see him in the audience. We're sitting right in front of you. Um, uh, so we invite you to, to get involved with some of those things. Uh, and then I'm glad the sister said this, but we also, it is this, this, this selling out thing. You know, it's not, it doesn't do us a service to focus on individuals and call them sellouts or whatever. We have to look at how they are rewarded or not rewarded based on their relationship to the state and the system, which is a capitalist system. It is an imperial system and it rewards those who benefit it. So we can look at it that way and say, you know, take it away from the personal. I never, rarely do I ever make uh, public criticism of individual artists for their choice or individual scholars for their choice, um, unless we're criticizing their scholarship. But but in terms of uh, uh, looking at the system itself, it will always look to replace or, or raise up. This is colonial. I mean, this is neo-colonialism. You have to have a black face to the imperialism. You have to have a Latino face to the imperialism or whoever uh, uh, to, to, to you know, facilitate the, the colonization of that population. But, uh, and I'm, but I'm, again, I'm glad Sister brought up, this is what capitalism does. This is how an, the capitalist economy functions. It requires that a few be uh, raised up to give the illusion to the rest that it's possible for the rest of them without there being this movement or revolutionary uh, effort. Um, thinking a little bit about the comment that was made earlier about Kanye's kind of lack of moral authority to make the comments he did about Katrina or whatever, it strikes me that there's almost like a new generation of hip-hop hip -hop artists and hip-hop fans, I think, too, who are very tech-savvy, who are very good at using new media and social media to connect with each other, communicate with each other, and disseminate their message. Um, and it seems like there's a lot of potential there for social change, but my sense is that, that forward thinking with regard to technology doesn't always necessarily translate into forward thinking with regard to social issues and politics. Uh, so I was wondering if you guys could comment a little bit on that disconnect and maybe what we can do about it. I think that those platforms are, they're just that. They're platforms for more democratic practice, but they don't inherently mean that we're going to get there. Um, I think, you know, again, we come back, like we've been spent just, you know, our organization has spent the last two years really asking ourselves, how could we consistently build um, radical thinkers and organizers? And I think the, the challenge is we, the way we are currently structured as movement organizations, nonprofits, whatever it is that you consider yourself, we are waiting for those people to come along. We have no real strategy to build them and build them consistently over time. Because if we're going to get there, we need a much larger cadre of people who can take this on their block, in their school, wherever they are. So I, I do think, and I was at actually at a really interesting gathering last year called Web of Change, and it's you know 10 years out, and it's all folks who started off with internet stuff who were just so excited and like, free code, and we're gonna be able to do this, and we're gonna be challenging the mainstream media because you know the internet is free. And now people are kind of like, yeah, but there's some other things that we needed. We thought that just like having a lot of emails would get us there, but emails don't build movement, as, as Rosa was saying. So I do, I think it's, it's a good platform, but if we don't have really strong popular education, if we do not know how to meet people where they are, if we don't ask ourselves, okay, where are they now? How do we begin to challenge this one idea? And then stay there a little bit. Let's, let's talk about it, let's debate it, because what we, ha we need is a combination of value shifting, um, as well as um, a deeper level of courage and 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 willingness to struggle and we've got comfort enough comfortable enough even in like in my neighborhood which is like one of the brokest in Roxbury people are just comfortable enough that they're like mm, why are you always protesting you know and at, and at the same time um, the level of analysis is just you know if you're constantly being fed information and you never spend the time digest even just like sitting around the table and eating and arguing over ideas it, it doesn't happen. Um, and so we need to create some communal spaces. We need to really get tighter on our popular education. Um, freedom schools, that was one of the most radical things that ever came out of the civil rights movement. It was what created the infrastructure of leaders that then made the civil rights movement possible. And it was led mostly by women, many of them who had been teachers in the, in the regular system and said, let's come out and do all the things we can't do in that system at night for people so that our people can be in the right place when the moment comes, we're ready to take advantage of it.
Um, I think it's an excellent question. And in, in my area, in Western Mass, I mean, a lot of people uh, we're teaching youth do video to do video production. A lot of stuff is, you know, uh, coming out of that in terms of shaping new visions and new representations. But you know, the big thing is that yeah, we use a lot of this technology. But I'm not one of these folks who is waiting on the latest thing so that I could jump on that, right? Uh, which is why I haven't opened a Twitter account. So you know, y'all not gonna be able to follow me on Twitter. I'm sorry. But the point is, is that every single time something new comes out. Everyone runs on it like it's the hottest thing. And so we need to think more consciously about why that's the case. Um, because I think that, you know, we're talking about systematic things. And this system that we're talking about, you know, relies on, depends on human participation and indeed complicity. But it stifles creativity and human potential. Okay? So it relies on your participation, but it only wants a little bit of it so that you can be made a consumer without consciousness. So we say, look, create, create, create with consciousness. So you're gonna have to build, I mean, I would love for the next Facebook to be, you know, a little uh, brother from my neighborhood. I would love that, a little holy oak Facebook, that would be great. But the point is, is that we need to get beyond the sheepish following of the latest and the greatest technology um, and really focus on uh, connecting that back to education as well because I think the, the reason why those uh, new platforms don't come from many of our communities is precisely because of the lack in engineering, you know what I'm saying, instruction, stuff like that that's, that's denied certain communities straight up. So there is a gap, but there's also um, people trying to navigate that um, trajectory and I, and I think that we're doing good at that, but again, don't be blind uh, in, in terms of following the next um, hot thing. You know, that's, that's a difficult thing for me, so. And Facebook, to echo Rosa, is not movement. <laughs> Even though there was a good thing that happened with the Twitter piece around the Oscar Grant trial where people were tweeting each other and they told each other, meet me down here at 14th and Broadway, and everybody was down there to let the city know that they didn't stand behind that verdict. Right? So, I mean, there's ways in which we could use it, but that's not the end-all, be-all of our movement building. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I just kind of walked in here. I, I'm, I'm curious what your consensus is on I mean, I mean, I'm hearing what you're against, kind of the capitalism and, and materialism, individualism. Uh, but, you know, there's this critique from like Thomas Sowell, like uh, you don't operate on grandpa uh, if you don't know what you're doing. So we've got this system. If, if you're a radical and you're just kind of raging against the system, uh, that system is working for a tremendous amount of people. If you, if you alter it too much, you, you can kill grandpa. So I'm, I'm curious, like, what exactly is the, the new thing that you guys are talking about when I hear the, the good life uh, dichotomy? I, I'm doing a documentary on a guy who, who runs a thing called the Good Life Organization right now. And uh, so, so I'm just curious, what, what would you say it is? this new thing. I mean, you know, I think that actually devalues, and you probably, like you say, you came in a little late, because when you say radical raging, already you're devaluing that in a way of how you just said that, right? Um, because, I'm how no, perceived if you're in this. If you oh yeah, if you just walked in, yeah, but also I think the larger point is that that's what happens when you begin to say, listen, I have to draw a line within hip hop politics or politics in general. I'm an independent thinker. I'm, a, I'm not in the two party system. I'm a radical. But immediately people's response a lot of times is like, well, you're just raging against the system. No, I organize against the system. I'm an organizer at heart, personally. I've been in massive started organizations. I've started organizations and I've been kicked out of them for like the National Hip Hop Political Convention that I was one of the founders for. I, I, I say this basically because we founded a convention and then I became too radical. Wow, within hip hop. And then it was really levels of sexism because the men just can't take women in power, I'm sorry. Like a lot of these men within that control, the organizing, the talking of hip hop cannot 
are intimidated not only by women but are increasingly intimidated by a discussion about LGBTI people are you know and so I have to say I'm radical but I'm also an organizer right like I'm an organizer at heart and I think all of us are organizers and, and try to work with young people and then um, lastly you know I think one of the biggest things that I know will ever go down is that me and Cynthia McKinney made up the first woman of color presidential ticket. We didn't rage against the system. We were in the trenches and them trenches were nasty and disgusting and, and threatening and, and horrific. To this day, neither Cynthia McKinney or me have fully worked since we ran because we are too radical, right? So um, I kind of want to to say that because I don't you know want anyone to think that particularly because I came up here very short and went hard that I'm just sitting at home raging and not doing something if I was to do that I would be already going crazy in some mental institution I think so but 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 of course you would say that I mean of course Thomas Sowell would say that I mean this is sort of my point I mean this is this is somebody you know again he's defending the dying grandfather because the dying grandfather has, has allowed Sowell and his compatriots the little one the little the, the few crumbs that would uh, pr pr uh, promote and fund and and highlight their work so the dead ideas are the dead ideas of defending capitalism of defending the idea as Sowell and others do that there is no racial oppression and that there is no systemic oppression of people around the world and so on and so forth those are the dead ideas is and let them die let grandpa die I don't care pull the plug on grandpa <laughs> grandpa is useless he should be out of here so 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 as so the, the people that I cited as sources during my few minutes and that I would continue to cite there let those ideas uh, be organized around and then the answers will be developed I don't have any grand solution but let's start with you know tax the rich and then we don't have to do any of these other things Get, stop going to war uh, 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 take away the book contracts of Soul and John McWhorter and all these other folks and give them to other people who can't get, they can't get published or invited to big conferences or given big stipends and funds at major universities. Let's do that and then everybody can figure out the answer. We don't have to come up here and be asked, give, give, what do we want? And then, and then be dismissed as radical lunatics because we disagree with the nonsense that's killing everybody in this country and around the world? I'm not, I mean, I'm not trying to hear that nonsense either. I mean, you know, anyway, I'm sorry, I'm stuck. So, yeah, um, just quickly, I will send you an email afterwards. We do have a list of nine things that we think everybody should have, from health and wellness to spaces to be challenged intellectually to places to um, connect with nature. So we've asked young people to go through your neighborhood. Do you have all these things in your community? Well, every single friggin' person needs to have these things, and if they don't, then it's inadequate. And I'm my critique of the you know the good life and of capitalism is it has not to date been able to provide that for folks. And I I work with and live in a community with the folks that it's really really not working for. But then it's really really not working for even more people outside of this country. So, I mean that would be my critique back. I do you know I'll share the nine, list of nine things. I'll email it to you. You can come up. We'll talk. Right up here. Do y'all think that government intervention has interfered oh, with the progression of hip hop? For instance, what happened in the '80s with Paris and Public Enemy, government put pressure on the record labels. Since that time, the conscious hip hop movement uh, in the mainstream media has decreased. What is, what is your opinion about that? I've been hearing praise. Oh, we love democracy now, da, da, da. but um, it's really welcome to like get some criticism. It's very important to get critis criticism of of the left, uh, free press, democracy now. Um, but if you guys could talk about what we can do. What the, left, what the left media can, can work on a little more, yeah. Um, I've been struggling with these issues all my life as a, as a person of color and the mother of boys who are also people of color. And uh, we live like a very multicultural life. We deal with people at all um, levels of society and education and finance. Um, but, you know, like it's just a widespread issue how do you get people to appreciate thinking outside the box? I mean, like kind of piggybacking off, off of your question, Paul, like where do you start the dialogue? How do you move people to see that there can be something better? There's more, more information is a good thing. People find more information so scary. They're like, oh, don't, I don't want to know about that, right? So well, you know, we don't want to know about a lot of things, but after we, you know, we find out that we, f we learned something and then we were able to take action and make a positive change and our world became better, 
then you know that that change is becomes meaningful but how do you get people to open their eyes and be you know like uh, willing to consider that that's possible but i really just wanted to kind of get like more specific like immediate action points because like I'm, you know, I'm not, I don't consider myself a rapper, but, you know, when I rap, I do political rap and no, nobody wants to hear it, you know, like, I mean, but, but this shit is really happening. So, I mean, someone has to start talking about it. So, I mean, we can, I'll, I'll talk to you guys afterward about action points. Okay. I think, you know, to answer the first question, look, we can study the sixties, but we need, also need to know that COINTELPRO never stopped. I mean, that's the real deal. Never stopped. Okay, it just mutated into different forms. But you will see um, evidence of that. And it comes through, you know, the way in which people who are protesting the war, you know, get ran over the coals. Um, anytime you make any type of public statement, and this is exactly the point that was being raised throughout the, throughout the panel, which is, is that what's sacrificed for popularity, right? You want to get the message out. You don't want to be stifled, don't want to be censored. But what are you, what are you willing to give up in order to keep uh, their visibility? And so we want to make more visible the political desires and needs over just the hyper visibility of, of black and brown bodies through the sex culture, you know, which this uh, capitalist media relies on. So, uh, you know, that's the answer, you know, Paul's piece is never it never stopped. And that's why we have to continue to talk about struggle and committing to to organizing and knowing where we stand before we go out there. Okay, I guess I'll answer the, the how, to, how to get people thinking outside the box. And I'll definitely share some materials. I think the reality is um, we've spent the last uh, two years really working on a curriculum that says you got to meet people where they are and inch them forward. So the, and I do believe that a lot of what we need is already in there. We just haven't had the space to really think about it and go deep about it. Um, so the frames we use are extremely simple. Like we make circles, self, family, community, and society. And then we just talk about like what are the interactions between those things? When are they good? When are they bad? When has society screwed you over? When have you done something that you know screwing society over? Just starting from there in a really simple way that people, like nobody has ever looked at our frames and been like, oh my gosh, I can't understand them. And I think so far often our popular education requires you to have like 10 levels of knowledge and know all of these like acronyms and blah, blah, blah. And that's just not helpful for people. I also think it's often not best to start with issues. It's best to start with people's real lived experience and then flow out from there. Um, so we don't have to start with a critique of racism. Let's just talk about our lived experience, how it's different from somebody else, and why we think society might have a role in shaping that. But I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. We're fr our frames are free. We don't ask you to pay for them. We hope you use them. <laughs> well, yeah, Democracy Now! I mean, me and Ravi are great friends. And, you know, I've known the whole DN team. God, I mean, I was with Amy at BAI when the coup happened in 2001. So I still think that Democracy Now! and Grit TV are, you know, obviously completely necessary. And in fact, Democracy Now! has great um, space now. And I know they're going to be doing more community stuff. They're doing curriculum stuff. But I think what should happen, Ravi, is that I, I do think that kind of like give us as much time as Chomsky gets in a year with different voices you know I mean I think about hip-hop and I go man I, I'm trying to collect every book that's been written on hip-hop and already it's, the list is like 200 right not because I'm going to agree with everything but look at that 200 books alone that you can go right now and get on the culture and study like or maybe a hip-hop correspondent some organizations won't have the ty same type of resources as a DN, you know. Um, oh, but I think that every, particularly progressive media who says that they care and love young people, it's kind of like Chuck D is like, people love hip hop, but do they love black people? You know, people love to talk about hip hop, what is bad, what is wrong, sometimes what is good, but do they actually have not only the practitioners of the culture there, the pioneers that keep giving us the, the, the history or see how these people have even transformed in their 30 or 20 or now 15 years within hip hop? Well, well, Dead Prez answered your, your question very careful, quickly. Uh, stu study Malcolm Garvey Huey. If you want to be a rapper, study Malcolm Garvey Huey. Um, Democracy Now!, uh, Bob McChesney uh, make a lot of the same mistakes. That I, and, and the reason I criticize them is because I only criticize the left because I like them and I appreciate their work. I think it's easy to criticize Fox and CNN and all that other nonsense. 
Um, I haven't missed the Democracy Now! program since 1999, so I know very well that there's been a, a center rightward slant in their coverage and their politics and their inclusion of uh, uh, black and African world people and their perspectives. Um, Democracy Now! and Bob McChesney, you know, they, they you know, both use black and brown people's music as their theme songs. Democracy Now! uses Incognito's song and then doesn't include any of these people in their, in their thought. Uh, McChesney uses Straight No Chaser from Thelonious Monk and doesn't have any black people. So the blackest part of their show is the, the introductory music. Um, he did have, uh, and I have to admit publicly that I helped behind the scenes get, get uh, Robin Kelly on McChesney's show to say, look, if you're going to play the man's music, get somebody, a scholar who studied Thelonious Monk and let him talk about it for an hour. Um, uh, do what Hemant Shaw has said about emancipatory journalism. I would love to see Democracy Now! do more locally based journalism. Covers, uh, involve the grassroots community. They're in New York City and yet New York City is never really discussed. Juan Williams is discussed as winning awards for his coverage of cor corruption in, in, in Juan Gonzalez. I'm sorry, what did I what is it? Oh God, my apology. My apology to everybody. That was a horrible. No, 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 no. <laughs> Wow, no, no, it's horrible. Uh, Juan Gonzalez is, is said, I'm just rushing. He's, he's given credit for winning the, these awards for his coverage of the, these stories in New York, but then they, the story itself is barely discussed. What happened in New York City? What was that story? How does it relate to the stuff we're seeing in terms of corruption being uh, uh, extended around the world? I'd love to see more political prisoners discussed. For Eddie Marshall Conway has a new book out. Uh, the Freedom Archives put out the COINTELPRO 101 documentary. None of these people are invited on to, to discuss the, their work. And then I I think that because they're not discussing the work and the problems that are still existing in this country, we're not changing this country and therefore we're not changing its international impact, not to mention its domestic one. So if you want to cover and talk about we don't want to bomb Libya, then talk about why we're not, why we haven't dealt with the fact that we haven't stopped the war on black and brown people and poor people in this country. There's just not enough coverage of that. Um, and then let some political rappers on from, you know, from, from around the, the world. They had Kane on, on. I think that was the only rapper you guys have had on. No? no? In the last year? Fronty and okay, my bad, but I thought it was interesting. Okay, forgive me, but I haven't. Uh, I hear you. I hear you, Paul, on that. But 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 Kanon came on there and w and Amy threw up a lob to him and asked him a question that allowed him to use his being from Somalia to talk negatively about the struggles of black people in this country. I thought that was a real nice little swipe, an anti Pan African swipe that got washed over. It was really bothering, to, it bothersome to me. So I think you know, let the folks in right down the street come on and talk about what's happening. Rebel Diaz is doing stuff. Uh, Grit TV interviewed them. They, they got stuff going on in the South Bronx uh, and, and they're not being discussed on Democracy Now! It's like the struggles that here, the struggles here, and this is what Makani and that, what I was saying earlier was this, this discussion about the media reform movement. It's following the same tropes that we have dealt with historically where white liberalism doesn't want to focus on what's happening in this country because they feel more responsible, maybe more guilty, and it's easier, safer, and more easily to fund coverage of what's happening in Palestine or somewhere else in the world than it is what's happening right down the street from their communities. To stop, but the younger brother, I feel like his. Where, where is he? Because I can't. What's your name? Christian. Part of what the work that y'all are going to have to do as younger people, because of new meat of technology, is also get off and start having ciphers, consciousness raising, be able to talk to each other for more than 10 minutes. You know, think of an idea through. But part of that is actually the physical contact and closeness that you have. Like I always say to folks, don't invite me at a protest via Twitter where the police are already there because you put it on Twitter. And second, who are you? I don't know you. If I'm going anywhere and sharing space with you, who are you? Where do you come from at least? What is at least your political line? I'm not just gonna meet you just because. I got to know that when I'm in the trenches and somebody's about, something's gonna happen with the popo, that everybody around me ain't gonna walk away and start Twittering, Rose is getting her ass beat by the police. Why y'all letting me get my ass beat and Twittering it? Can y'all help me out? <laughs> you know, so I just wanted to come to you at that because I think what you asked was profound and that, that a lot of young people are asking that. And really, I'm telling you, the more you read about your people, you will fall in love with your people. So listen, we're out of time. Um, we all have information, and uh, we love to share it with you in terms of how you can stay in contact with each of us. And um, thanks again to our panelists, and thank you for participating. <laughs>